Hi, everyone. Hello. You all look like you could use a little more caffeination this morning. <laughs> no offense. Uh, thanks so much for coming to the activism panel. I'm really excited about this. I hope you are too. My name is Jasmine Singer, and I am the director and co-founder of Our Hen House, which you can find online at ourhenhouse.org. We're based in New York City, so we're mainly virtual. And it's a multimedia hive of opportunities for people who are interested in getting involved with changing the world for animals. So we have a daily blog. Every day we post a different opportunity for getting involved in your own way. And we have a weekly podcast. Yesterday was our 85th consecutive weekly episode. And we have a video production unit. So I hope you check that out. And I'm really excited about today's panel, particularly because this conference is so amazing and refreshing. And I, I love that they're incorporating a lot of activism into it, because I sometimes find that there's a bit of a divide bet between the foodie world and activism. And when we're talking about veganism, there's obviously a lot of overlaps between the two and ways that we can use food as activism. So we have a very impressive panel today. And we're going to hear from everyone for about five minutes. We have, not in this order, Issa Chandra Moskowitz from the Post Punk Kitchen, Lee Chantel from Viva La Vegan, Sunny Subramania. That right? <laughs> I wrote it out phonetically from PETA2. Right? Yeah. Ryan Patey from Tofu Magazine and Chelsea Lincoln from Flavor Vegan. And we are representing three countries. So we're going to, okay, one is the United States and one is Canada, but whatever. <laughs> it's still three kind of Australia, as you can tell. Um, so, so hopefully by the end of today's panel, we're going to really learn more about the overall importance of not only using the internet to propel our mission, but to really use our own talents and skills for those who can't speak up for themselves. So everyone's going to speak for about five minutes or so, then I have some prepared questions that I'm going to throw out to them, and then after that we're going to open the floor for questions. This, this workshop is an hour and 15 minutes, and what I really love is to use the Q&A uh, for a large portion of that. So I hope that you all come up with questions and jot them down and save them for the Q&A part at the end. So that's enough from me. We're going to hear from Lee Chantel first. Hello. Can everyone hear? Can everyone hear? Um, I run vivalavegan.net and I started that in 2005 to promote my recipe calendars that I released after studying naturopathy and nutrition. And um, I originally just focused the website on promoting the calendars, but it has grown um, to an interactive website where um, it covers, I like to think, most of the aspects of veganism. And um, I've released a, a detox diet ebook on there. I've got um, recipes, I have podcasts, I do videos with people, I do interviews with um, inspiring vegans. I also have how to videos like how to make scrambled tofu and educational videos as well. Lots of recipes, lots of articles. There's a vegan mentor section, there's a member <coughs> section. Um, and I also have a blog on there. My blog is just part of the website, it's just one way that I. I utilise um, the blog to get people to come to the website and um, I'm working on some books at the moment, um, various books, I give talks on the, um, what, what do vegans eat or the um, environmental implications of your diet and things like that. I run a not-for-profit group in Brisbane called Green Earth Group and I put on a festival in Brisbane and it's an all-vegan environmental festival because I think the environmental aspect of veganism is just as important as all the other aspects. Um, and um, yeah, we had three to four thousand people at my festival, and that was um, yeah not for profit group, and um, all advertised through social media marketing because I, I work in social media marketing, so I do like YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter um, work for clients, and um, so my my passions are like communication and um, writing, speaking to people, I love networking. And so I utilise those skills that I have as much as I can through my various websites. So I also have a website at leeshontel.com because I was going to be a rock star in a previous <laughs> life. And um, <clears throat> at the moment I'm working on some books, doing some talks. I came to um, America mostly for the Animal Rights Conference in LA where 
where Jasmine and I spoke about promoting on the internet, and also here where I'm speaking a few times. Um, one of my friends is a children's entertainer, so I'm working on a, um, a DVD called Going Green with Renata at the moment. So I've been like script writing and project managing the filming of that. And when I get home, I'm doing like all the marketing and promotion for that, so it's a bit of fun. <coughs> Um, for Green Earth Group, we're working on a DVD and a magazine, and we do regular um, monthly video viewings, um, and we do letter writing nights, we do potlucks, get togethers, and we also just were meant to have a furry friends picnic where, where your animal companions could come as well, but it got rained out. Um, but that was pretty exciting. And um, I just try to promote every aspect of veganism because I believe everyone has the skills and the talents to promote veganism as best we can. So I'm trying to, I'm all about trying to get people to work out what their passions are and their experiences and their expertise and just get them to utilize that. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't really sure how I was gonna follow that one. Um, <laughs> But, but you did actually, near the end, you kind of, it's a good segue for me now. Um, can everyone hear me? I'm guessing I can. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I guess I'm the editor and maybe founder of Tofu Magazine, which is a, right now it's an online pay what you can magazine that's uh, available internationally, obviously, um, except maybe in some places where they ban such things online. Um, and uh, I guess I started it originally, um, I was doing a music festival in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is on the east coast of Canada, and I decided to do a vegan cookbook for a fundraiser for it. Uh, I wasn't vegan at the time, but I knew a few people who were, who were involved with the festival. So we ended up doing two cookbooks, they went really well, and then uh, I just, something snapped maybe in my brain, and I thought, why not do a magazine? Because the cookbooks are going well. Uh, there's a lot more work to the magazine, <laughs> um, but the the segue um, from what Lee Chantel had said was that I'm trying to use it as a way to provide pretty much anyone who's vegan with a soapbox um, to just kind of put their voice out there with the idea that I want to sort of highlight the fact that you can't really box a vegan in, like you can't really stereotype them as this sort of person or that sort of person. I mean maybe say 10, 20 years ago, that might have been a little easier to do, but now where veganism is like, I mean, it's definitely not mainstream, but it is becoming an easier thing to do. Um, there are a lot more people out there doing it, so we just kind of have an open forum for people if they want to write an article about, you know, being a vegan housewife, if they want to write an article about like just veganic gardening, um, it's all kind of perfectly fine to do. Um, we also, try to have a, a focus for each issue and the focus typically is like uh, basically the topic that we think needs more focus um, and so the new issue that's coming out hopefully within the next week or two if I can get some time to sit down and really work it um, involves the uh, the intersection of veganism with other forms of oppression say sexism and racism and um, just forms of privilege and how that relates to, obviously my creative director could probably do this a lot better, it's kind of her, her baby for this topic. Um, just obviously how veganism isn't necessarily like a perfect movement, and there are some people that may be vegan that feel left out because of other parts of their life that aren't considered in the vegan movement. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes over with people. Um, it's been a very polarizing kind of thing when we have mentioned it to some people. They either totally spark up and love it or they just kind of shut down and walk away. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, basically I'm just trying to provide a soapbox for other people and, you know, see what we can do to get the word out there and get more people knowing about what veganism is and its many kind of shades and forms and everything. Um, well, when I was trying to prepare for this talk, I was starting to get like a little nervous, wondering what I got myself into, because I feel like it's been a while since I've done what I've, you know, always stamped activism to be. Um, I'd been doing activism, you know, over 15 years now, and when I first started out, um, I kind of went, you know, hardcore into it, um, doing all sorts of different, running different campaigns, was the director of uh, Students for the Ethical Treatment of Animals down at University of Oregon. 
um, organizing all sorts of different you know, protests and signature collections, um, getting arrested, um, you know, all sorts of different stuff, and um, you know, including a really awesome campaign where in Corvallis um, there was a veterinary class that used terminal uh, surgery on dogs as a way of educating the students. And so uh, the student organization, animal rights organization there, started a campaign and I kind of came in uh, midway in it. Um, and it started out kind of, you know, civil disobedience, trying to get meetings with people, uh, protests all the time, uh, one time doing a dance in at night <laughs> to freak them out because there was like, we heard a rumor that they were afraid of a break in that night for some reason, so we thought it would be fun. Um, <laughs> so doing all this different stuff, um, and we finally started actually being able to talk with the administrators from the college. Um, and had to do meetings of, um, like created this little committee, and suddenly, you know, we wanted to talk to, with all the, uh, you know, people from the vet school and in charge. Um, so it was great that we had these meetings, but all of a sudden, all these hardcore activists had to talk to these people that we really hated. <laughs> and so we had to like calm down and find ways to create dialogue and have, um, you know, communication. Um, and parts of it went great, parts of it didn't. Um, some people weren't capable of it. Luckily, some of us were, um, because uh, eventually that class was is no longer being taught, and they now use the um, Oregon Humane Society um, to do uh, spays and neuters for instead of a terminal surgery on dogs. Um, and so I think like that was kind of like a changing point for me in terms of um, recognizing all the different ways that you can be an activist. Um, you know, I've I've continued to do. Um, you know, different activism in my life, but not in the, you know, first sense that I had of what an activist is. Um, you know, this day and age, um, you know, I have my blog, Flavor Vegan, um, where I first started it out, it was gonna be like, try to be professional-like and do recipes. I just wanted really people to see how good vegan food is. But I've always had really strong opinions, <laughs> and I'm always just an activist at heart. And so I started to, you know, implement you know, different things about, you know, Thanksgiving was coming up, so I talked about the torture that turkeys go through, or someone annoyed me with something they said about, you know, uh, cage-free eggs. So I'd start doing posts about how that's not cruelty-free. Um, and then anything also from, um, you know, things that celebrities did that pissed me off, I would do a comment, or there was a free day at the zoo, and I was like, yeah, I'll go to it and then I can talk about how awful it was, which I did, but it was also so depressing. <laughs> but it was good to like put it out there in a forum um, that I use as my blog. So now it's just whatever I want it to be, which is kind of fun. Um, but I also volunteer at the Audubon Wildlife Care Center here in Portland. Um, and a lot of people wouldn't put that into a grouping of animal rights because most of the people that are volunteering at things like that, they're most of them are not vegan or vegetarian. I mean, it's weird, because you know, here you are saving a bird, and they're gonna go home and eat a chicken. <laughs> um, but it's been good in terms of, I really like the hands-on approach of helping animals. Um, I'm really into wildlife. Um, and those are my focuses, so it allows me to actually go in and make a difference. But then also talk about, you know, when I have opportunities about being vegan, because I think those people are more likely to maybe, you know, get some wheels turning and, and think a little bit more. Um, and um, also implement it in other ways of my life that, you know, you wouldn't think it of as stereotypical activists. Um, at my jo uh, job, uh, we sell uh, products um, throughout the uh, US, it's Bob's Red Mill. Um, and when I first started working there, I got implemented on the labels, egg replacers. Um, and so suddenly, all these packages that otherwise would not have given any vegan options have egg replacers. So people that maybe otherwise would have just assumed you could only use eggs or have to really search for it can now just make things automatically vegan. And so I think kind of my point of 
say and all that is kind of, you know, activism is not just one thing, and it's finding what works for you and how you can make a difference in your own life and put it into that and be open to what activism can be because um, it gives you more opportunities to be an activist in your very own way. Um, hi, I'm with PETA 2. Um, PETA 2 is the youth division of PETA, so our target audience is 13 to 21 year olds. Um, I run and coordinate the PETA 2 blog, I write a lot of the content, and we have some staff bloggers, and we also have guest bloggers from time to time. Um, and we cut, we very band centric, we have a lot of band interviews, um, we do work tour tabling, and uh, any major tour that's going on, um, we try to table. Uh, which recruits a lot of kids uh, to even be open to veganism or whatever issues going on at the time. Um, we have a street team where you can join our street team and earn points for free swag just by doing simple things like sharing things on Facebook or taking a photo of a sign that says some, something about not eating chickens or whatever and emailing it to the street team. Um, we provide tons of campaign materials um, and lots of DIY, like print out your own stencils, stickers, signs, um, and we're very responsive uh, as far as like if anybody has any questions or needs help about veganizing your cafeteria or whatnot, uh, we will do everything we can to make it happen. And some of our most successful blogs are action alerts, um, like if an airline's transporting monkeys experimented on or whatever and it's like okay everybody street team people you know send emails now and it's crazy because you can see how many people react just from the simple blog post or by them posting on Facebook or Twitter and then bam like two or three days later like plans were canceled and it's like a victory <laughs> and kids will leave comments like oh my god I'm so glad I, I had one of those emails was mine like I actually took action and it's good to see it's good to see that um, I also on the side, this is like not part of my job descri description, I just started making like silly little P2 videos. Um, I wrote a, a seal rap song <laughs> during like the Canadian <laughs> seal hunt where I dressed up in a PETA seal costume and I was just like rapping it on down. Um, I also did one for Thanksgiving where I dressed up as tur a turkey named Turkey Lurkey. Um, and I was just rapping about like, don't eat me or whatever. Anyways, those are on our YouTube channel. Um, let's see, our current campaign right now is about veganizing your cafeteria. It's the Veggie Burger Project. Um, so again, we're helping to do whatever we can um, to get vegan options. And that, like now more than ever, because veganism is becoming more mainstream and the whole health aspects and environmental aspects, like so many college students want to veg options, whether they're vegan or not. It's like in high demand. Um, so that's really exciting. <laughs> we also provide resources for, um, like we encourage people, kids to write uh, their papers or do speeches at school based on animal rights to help spread the message. Um, we do a lot of myth-busting blogs, uh, DIY recipes for like cruelty-free body scrubs or shampoo or anything. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, and nutrition, because uh, most of our readers are Oreo cookie eaters, and that's about it. Um, they're not quite getting it, so I'm always afraid, like, oh my god, they're going to fall off the wagon because they're going to feel sick, and they're not doing it right. Um, we also try to tell them in blog posts, like, the co correct way to be an activist, which is really key, because um, a lot of these kids get, like, really angry and confrontational and don't really understand, like, proper way to provide information to masses. Um, and it's just really fun to be able to write with a young voice for a young audience. Like it really is, like not that I'm making buku dollarinos, but like I feel really fulfilled and it's amazing to work for such a powerful organization. Like they really are powerful. And if you look at their list of victories, it's like mind blowing. And I know there are people who are anti-PETA and like, you know, there might not be every single thing that PETA stands for that I agree with either, but um, like, it's pretty amazing that they have the power to reach people and specifically the PETA 2 department, which is aimed towards young people. I went vegan when I was a sophomore in college. So I know that's a key, that's a key time when we're all wanting to be our own individual and you know, finally be ourselves outside of our parents' house and eat the way we want and live the way we want. So it's like really key to hit up that, those fresh young people.
bowl. <laughs> and that's it. Hi. Um, I'm a little sick. I'm not sitting this far because she's from PETA. It's just sitting this far. <laughs> 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 Well, I guess uh, I want to talk about local activism a little bit because um, sorry, it's the sickness. And I didn't do anything last night. I went home and went to bed at 11. And that's what, it, that's what you get. <laughs> um, all right, so lately the kind of thing that I've been doing is raising money because so many, there are so many organ, organizations that need it, so many local shelters, so many people, things like, you guys know what I do. We can just move on to something else. <laughs> Do you want to use your hat? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Okay, okay, no, I'm going to totally get into this and talk about it. Um, all right, I'll start with the bake sale stuff. I think a lot of you are probably already involved in the bake sales. Yeah. Yeah, bake sales. Yeah. <laughs> so that seems to be a really great way to not just promote veganism, but to raise money. And I think that's so important. Just because everybody's basically broke, and you know, as usual, animals are coming last on the list of people's priorities. So, um, when you do a big sale, you can raise money and spread vegan messages, and or the vegan message, and um, just media loves it. Everybody loves it, so it gets a lot of attention and brings eyes onto your cause and onto veganism. So, so yeah, to a big sale. And I like to think everybody has skills, and you know, a lot of activists are always saying, "Well, use what your skill is and be an activist in that way." But really, you should just do big sales because <laughs> <laughs> um, it really works. Uh, lately, I've been kind of trying to do things where I'm living, and right now that's Omaha. So one thing I do is do a four-course dinner and raise money for local shelters. Um, does anybody have a tissue? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was fine yesterday, even though I lost at the game show. And if you guys were in the game show, I lost because I was getting sick. <laughs> <laughs> I, was getting sick. <laughs> I was sick the first part of the week, so. Okay. Thanks. Getting everything. Massage. So, yeah. So I've been doing this thing called the Four Courses, Four co Four Causes. It's hard to say, but it looks really cute written because <laughs> you can use a four twice. <laughs> um, and. Those kinds of things, food activism, tend to get a lot of attention. I mean, obviously, one of the first things we learn when we go vegan is that you win people over through food. So I try and do that since I'm a cookbook author. I figure that works out pretty well for me. So um, I've been doing these four course dinners where I try and get buy from the local farms. Obviously, in Omaha, that's kind of tough because it's going to be corn. The corn dessert course and the corn salad course and the corn entree, but um, but there's there is some stuff happening there. And one of the reasons I really wanted to move there is because like in Portland I'm basically pointless. Like nobody gives a shit. So <laughs> they're like, oh yeah, a vegan dinner. I'm okay, thanks. I'll, I'll go microwave a pizza. So um, so yeah, it just felt better for me to move to Omaha where it's. Again, it's like, that's Omaha Steaks, you know, that's the heart of it. And kind of anything I do there is so much more effective and people actually care. <laughs> Not that nobody cared in Portland, but just like people are, you know, Portland's well on its way to being vegan and it kind of felt like I'm, you know, I could do, it's just another four-course dinner. But in Omaha, you do this and people are coming for their, maybe their first vegan experience and um, just, supporting the, the animal groups there who hardly get any support and actually groups, it's, it's really interesting also just to see the, um, 
the mind frame of people. Like here, for instance, in Portland, nobody goes to Whole Foods. Like that's, and it makes sense for nobody to go to Whole Foods in Portland. But in Omaha, you're like, that's your hub, is Whole Foods. And you're like, they, you know, you're so happy that Whole Foods is there. And, um, but also with the organizations, like here, I don't, I don't know why I'm comparing Portland to Omaha, it's just where I went, but, but I guess I kind of want to talk about local activism, and so it's going to make sense in a second. And I'm sick, don't forget that part. <laughs> so, and there are groups like, even like the, the really, you know, har not harmless, I don't know what the word is, but groups like HSUS, which are almost vilified in more radical communities, are such a huge threat in Nebraska. Like, um, the, the CEO of Humane Society came to speak in Omaha, and it was the, the mayors like, spoke out against him. Like, that's how much of a threat, even uh, farms making the smallest changes to start treating animals a little bit better, are such a huge threat there. You know, it's just pretty, Uh, remarkable how seeing the tiny changes being made and like wondering was a city like Portland like that 15 years ago I mean I've, I passed through 15 years ago and I don't think it was ever quite as drastic but yeah so so to do a benefit dinner there and to raise you know thousands of dollars for an organization like one of the organizations I'm raising money for right now is a feral community a feral cat rescue community and they get no support, not only to people, I mean, people shoot cats there. That's the kind of mentality that's there. It's not even like, you know, you, it, just getting the word vegan in would be so, like, you're like 100 steps away from that. It's more like, okay, hey, don't shoot cats. <laughs> so that's the kind of mentality that you're dealing with. And I think a lot of people just, I mean, everybody's like, how could you move there? What are you doing? And like, I actually am, I feel, just much better. Like I grew up in the 80s and uh, activism back then was a struggle, you know, and it was like even in New York City or in Brooklyn, it wasn't easy to be an activist. It wasn't easy to, there weren't really that many animal organizations and you kind of were doing it yourself, you know, we'd have these, I'm totally going off on a tangent, is that okay? <laughs> yes. I'll end it in a second. <laughs> My tangent's almost over. So it's just kind of what I'm used to, and I think when life is too easy, I just wonder how effective your activism is being, you know, like, so I guess being there and knowing and seeing everything, kind of seeing people's reactions and seeing people taste vegan food and be totally stoked, having a vegan bake sale there and making $4,000 was, in Omaha, was just, just so fulfilling. And, and to create this little oasis in the middle of the country, you know, and have my vegan friends pass through and come eat, you know, instead of being like, uh, oh, like coming to visit me in Portland and not talking to me because they're out at a homegrown smoker or whatever, <laughs> you know? I don't know, just it's been really, really, really fulfilling to me to be there and to be making a difference. And which brings me to the point of, this is what I was going to talk about. I was doing these four course dinners and one of the things we do is take a tchotchke from the, uh, the cause. So if it was a farm cause, we would get a bunch of cows and put them on the table. For dogs, we do the same thing. For cats, we do the same thing. So I was buying all these tchotchkes for the centerpieces of the table, and I thought, you know, I can make this super cool instead of just having this BA um, cute little tchotchke. So I started spray painting them, and I was like, wow, these look really, really awesome. It looks like I'm on HGTV. <laughs> and then, um, I, then I started collecting them from all over the country and started um, uh, this thing called the Teal Cat Project which is what I'm working on now, which is basically raising money for feral cats in different communities. And I really want to highlight the difference between, I can't do it right now, saving cats in New York versus saving cats in Omaha, where the mentality is so different, but there's still a lot of resistance to letting people into the community to make those changes. Anyway, point is, um, I put the cats up online, and three days later, raised $4,000. <laughs> and so that felt really good. And that was for an organization in New York City. And I guess the point that I was trying to make and didn't do it very well was about uh, community activism and doing stuff in your local community and getting support from your local community because that's probably the most effective way to bring people in to get a cause that they care about that's right there. And um, I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, I have a few questions for each of you and then just some to throw out there 
for any of you, and then we'll open it up to all of you. <coughs> so Lee Chantel, I'm curious uh, how you find that environmentalists, or environmentalists, react when they go to these veg fests that you put on that have a lot of animal rights messaging, but really are geared toward the environmentalist crowd, because I know that for many of us, there's some struggle sometimes with bridging the animal rights and the vegan message with environmentalists. Um, yeah, definitely. Well, at, at my festival, um, I don't actually say vegan to people, so it's called Green Earth Festival, Green Earth Day, and um, it's not marketed as a vegan festival because um, my focus is trying to get to the mainstream instead of preaching to the converted. Um, and we get a lot of people that are interested in the env environmental um, aspects rather than veganism. And there's a lot that don't even realise the connection which is good because then they, they see the two connections and um, we have, like we um, organised all our own signage so we had like creative days where we were making all signage so we weren't actually buying more products for that and we just had signs and quotes and facts all around the botanic gardens where we had um, the festival and there's information that they can go around and um, educate themselves with instead of us sort of um, you know, throwing it in their face all the time, which I think is a good way for people to learn if they come to come to it themselves, rather than because I know if someone told me to do something, that's the last thing I really want to do. So I try to just think of how other people would be, and yeah, they educate themselves and go to the different stalls and eat the food as well, because um, we had like about I think nine food vendors at the festival, so people can see how good the food is, and they're like, oh, maybe this vegan thing's alright. Very cool. Ryan, you talked a bit about how our vegan movement is far from perfect, which is true. What are some ways that you think we could improve that? <laughs> <laughs> Fix it. <laughs> um, well, I think, actually, again, I don't know if maybe I'm depending on you too much to intro <laughs> what I'm talking about. but. Uh, I think again, like there are a lot of um, there are a lot of great movements out there that you know there are plenty of people out there trying to change this or that, and um, even though I mean obviously like picking one, you can spend every day of your waking life working on it. Um, maybe taking a little extra time to actually learn about those other things that are going on and how they relate to what you're doing, because I think. Activism, activism is great and everything, but when your activism steps on someone else's activism, um, how much good are you really doing? Like, you know, if you're if you're not, if you can do something that also helps their cause, then maybe they're going to also want to help your cause. And I think you know, pretty much anyone in the world has an interest in making, even if it's just like their life and maybe their family life better. Having that in mind and not necessarily going, hey, this is the vegan thing that I want to make better. You've got your thing over here, but that's not the vegan thing. So unless you want to do the vegan thing, I, whatever, go away. Just trying to maybe understand where they're coming from and why what they're concerned about is such an important thing to them might open the door of, oh, hey, okay, now I understand why your thing is so important. And I mean, maybe they won't totally convert and everything, but at least you know, at the end of the day, maybe if you need, say, want them to come to a bake sale, maybe they will, versus totally pushing away because maybe they're pushing for, like, I don't know, labor union rights or something at a factory farm, which obviously is a bit of a contrast to the veganism thing, but I mean, still, like, workers' rights are an important thing. So, yeah, I think maybe taking 10 extra minutes to look at other things on the internet besides <laughs> cats and animal rights blogs. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's great advice. Chelsea, what are some, I, I really thought it was interesting that you had a blog and sort of in the process of having a blog came to your activism. And I know that there's a lot of people in here who have a blog and I'm wondering what are some ways that people in this room can incorporate more activism into their foodie blogs? Well, I think kind of just being true to who you who you are. You know, if you have like a topic that you're concerned with or something that comes up in your life, 
Um, you know, don't be afraid to integrate it into your blog and be t be able to talk about it. Um, you know, it might be something depending on you know the structure of your blog. It might be something where maybe it's going to be on the side um, because you have a very specific mission. But I think finding your voice and being true to it, which is exactly what happened with mine. Um, but things that happen in your daily life are things that are blogable as well. That you know can be anything from you know great recipes to just random experiences. Um, you know, I think sometimes we forgot the power of our own words. Um, you know, because even if we don't see an immediate change uh, when we talk about something, either in life or on our blog, um, you know, it can make changes that we don't even know about. So I think just being, you know, not being afraid to use your own voice and having your own voice. Um, I've had to have, I've dealt with backlash in my life for all sorts of stuff <laughs> that I like to talk about. Um, but luckily I also have, um, you know, good friends that I know will back me up as well as experience knowing, you know, my voice and what I need to say and being true to it. I love that. Sunny, I have a two-parter for you. Uh, do you find that, have you found in your experience at PETA 2 that fostering activism in kids sticks with them through adulthood? Like, do you have any stories of that? And the second part of that question is, you work for a top-down organizational campaign, and I'm wondering, it's clear to me from what you're saying that you really believe in the power of people getting involved in any way they can that makes sense to them. So what are some ways that you think that young people can get involved in activism that's not necessarily part of a PETA campaign? Yeah, I'm gonna start with a second. Okay. <laughs> Um, just doing something as simple as like wearing AR shirts or like a tote that says ask me why I'm vegan, like something as simple as that is a great way to be an activist because um, people will ask you, so why are you vegan? Um, and then you just opened up a conversation right there. Um, and it's always good, you know, if you're signed up with change.org or any of those websites where you can just simply fill out a petition and so many of them just like save your information so you just have to hit send anytime you go to that website, which is really nice. Um, PETA's actually set up like that too where it's like form letters all filled out and you just put in your name and ta-da! Um, and simple things like um, getting rid of animal testing products or phasing them out in your home, um, getting like cooking for your family, introducing more vegan options and introducing them to quinoa and tempeh and things that they've never, never maybe heard about. Um, and it's really important, I think we all stress community, it's really important to find people that are like-minded so you don't have to feel isolated, which I think goes to the first part of your question. I think kids will stick with it as long as they feel like they're not outsiders or alone. And there's tons of forums, and thank God there's like a gazillion vegan blogs that they have reference to. So that's veganism, but what about fostering the activism? I mean, I'm glad to hear that they're going to stick with the veganism, but is it going to change the way they are sort of developmentally since they're still at a very formative stage in their life and going to sort of implant in their brains to do something about what's wrong? Well, since they don't get to like follow up with any of these kids long term or anything, I would hope so. I mean, based on comments and feedback I get from the kids, they're really passionate. Like, it blows me away. And sometimes I get teary reading comments because I'm like so proud of these people. Um, they're like really riled up. And like, I, 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 just, I just assume like the kind of activist that is like that, they just have something in them that is like a passion that will yeah. follow them like throughout life. Um, and then there's like the lazy activists that are just like, I'm vegan, that's it, right? Um, so it's hard to say. I don't exactly know the answer to that, but I would hope so. I have hope. <laughs> cool. yeah. Well, I think so. I mean, I, I think, think so. that it's, it's, the results sort of speak for themselves and there is movement, you know, yeah. in our movement. Issa, I really love what you talked about uh, regarding how you live in a small town now, which I, how many of you feel like you live in like a small town or let's just say not New York, San Francisco, Portland, or LA. Okay. So that's most people in this room. I love how, yeah, there's so many, because I live in New York, and so many people are like, oh, it's so much easier, you know, in New York, and I just love this, this sense of, well, it's up to us, it's up to the people in small towns to create change wanted to say that. And um, for people who want to start community-wide projects in their areas, 
one thing you have had so much success at is amping it up so it's not just a grassroots project, but you've gotten a lot of media attention. You've got the worldwide vegan bake sale covered in huge media outlets. How, how can people really step up their game so that their community building is recognized on a grand scale? And do you think that that's important? I think it, taking part in things like the Worldwide Vegan Bake Sale or the Bake Sales for Haiti or something that's going on worldwide in your, in a, in your town is always smart. You know, you get it covered in your town, plus when major media covers it, it looks bigger to be like, oh, we had a bake sale. In all these different places, as opposed to just one. So media. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wait. No. I, so you're saying that like getting the attention of the media to cover it in your small paper yeah. it can be really important. Yeah. Um, wait. What was the exact? No, no, I, I was just wondering. So so media is one way that people could really amp it up so that it gets more attention. Are there other ways? And do you think that that that's a necessary component? to community building, or do you think community building should stay kind of insular? No, that's like footloose. <laughs> like, no, we should all be able to build community. No, I think like uh, taking part in things that are going on in a larger, in a, on a larger scale, and then also just doing the stuff that specifically speaks to your community. Obviously, wherever you're from will have a different issue. Like seal hunting, I wouldn't do something in Omaha about seal hunting. So just knowing what's going on, staying staying part of not just your vegan community, because you might not have one, but the activism community, because there's activists everywhere. It doesn't have to be specifically vegan activists. So, and I think just talking about um, doing the bird sanctuary or the Audubon Society, things like that, find people that care and hang out with those people and don't judge them and remember we're not, we're all imperfect people. And, you know, it's, it's important that we understand that um, we didn't come out of our, you know, we didn't, we weren't born vegan. We all came to this from something, and so seeing those things in other people, and instead of judging them, just relating to them because they are us. That's some really good advice. It's important to remember. Uh, for anyone on the panel, are there any talents that you had in your pre-activist lives that you find yourselves surprised to be using in your activism? Like, I, I have a theater background. I feel like I've tried to put theater into when I give talk. So like that, Lee Chantal? Well, yeah, I guess because I've come from a music background, so um, I've had the experience in front of stage and things like that. So I'm not as nervous speaking in front of people or performing to people, and I can talk on camera, and I can do you know video stuff. So that helps, yep. Did any of you, Ryan? Uh, I think. Again, I think we should probably just share. <laughs> she doesn't really believe right now. She's popping up her nose. <laughs> I don't have any, so. Exactly. That's what I um, No, well, I, uh, I, what, eight years now, I've been involved in the music scene in Canada. Um, and so I did, like, kind of have to rationalize getting here and hopefully making it a little cheaper. I did a tour across Canada to promote the new issue of the magazine, which I thought was going to be out before the tour, but that didn't happen. So, um, but I mean, because of like because of being involved in, with the music scene, uh, the idea of say doing a tour that maybe focuses more on the vegan thing than say like this great musician that probably no one's going to come out to listen to, um, it didn't seem as daunting because I had done the music thing. And it's like okay, book a tour across Canada or down through the states. So, doable, whatever, and I have couches to sleep on, which also really helps. Um, so I think that that has helped. Um, plus I'm not, I'm not as afraid to like just blindly send out an email to someone or like to talk to people and say, hey, do you want to write for the magazine? Even though I've never met you, except maybe for this weekend. Mm -hmm. I've got people here that I've been emailing for like years that I've never actually even heard their voice, but it's okay because I'm used to it with the music scene. Did any of you study writing? You said you did? Um, I have a journalism background. Okay. Um, I used to write for a couple of newspapers, which was, um, I thought I wanted to do that for a living, but it's so boxy and square. I actually wanted to be a television, like, newscaster, <laughs> but then I was like, they all look like they're wearing wigs and they all talk <laughs> funny. Um, so, and I have a personal uh, beauty blog, Vegan Beauty Review, so I get to incorporate a lot of, like, vegan beauty recipes on the PewDiePie blog. And, cool. And, <laughs> 
So what advice would you have for people who come to this conference and have never really considered themselves an activist before but want to get involved? Is there a particular way that you recommend getting involved in that journey or, or is it different for everyone? Is there more specific advice you can give them? Um. Chelsea? <laughs> Um, well, I would say, I mean, just a matter of, you know, take the word activist and what you think that is and kind of throw it out the window. Because you can define what an activist is for yourself and for your own life. And find what you're most passionate about and what's in your, what's around you and just kind of go for it. Um, and I think that's going to be different for everyone. So it is kind of just more a matter of kind of getting in touch with yourself, um, finding any type of community, either online or locally if there is some, so you can have support, but you know, just kind of be true to yourself. I have one more question before I open it up. How do you avoid activist burnout? I, I, the fact that animals are dying like every second of every day, if you were to constantly think about that, we would all be like suicidal zombies. It gets so depressing and hard sometimes, so it is a good idea to kind of step back when you are feeling overwhelmed. Just take like a little activist vacation and recharge, reboost, and then jump back on board. It's my advice. I think uh, part of it, again, to go with the touring thing, um, I mean, yeah, obviously there's, there's a bleak, a couple of bleak facts that sort of hang over all of what we're doing, but I mean, I don't know, as, as sort of cliche as it sounds, even just sitting outside in like a park or something, giving yourself five minutes to realize the fact that like the world's still going and people can still be laughing and animals can still be playing and I'm talking like Disney here, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I mean, we'll say like when we did the first tour a couple years ago, like I got to see the Grand Canyon and the Redwoods and knowing that the Redwoods are there, like so there's like just something great nature. about that. Yeah, just giving yourself five minutes to go, you know what, like, even though, and I mean, part of it might be because, like, coming from the East Coast of Canada, like, this idea of factory farms and everything isn't as obvious, and, like, I can go outside of my hometown and hike up a, a hill if I want, and it's just trees and animals, and there's no, like, noisy traffic or anything. So, I mean, obviously, it might be a little harder in cities and stuff, but there are parks and everything. So just giving yourself five minutes to sort of step away from like this constant news feed on your computer and like television and everything else, and just being like, you know what, I can still breathe the air, and you know, five minutes, just take it and sort of realize what it is that you're fighting for is still kind of there. Yeah, totally, I think a few of you also spoke about the importance of community building and finding a safe space and colleagues who get it and get you, things like that. I think just stuff like this, like I feel so much better after this weekend, except for the death oh. illness. <laughs> you know, just, I mean, this was inspiring. So being together and learning stuff and watching sick people ramble on. <laughs> More that. Yeah, I'm, I'm like Ryan as well, I'm going out into nature, you know, feel the grass under my feet is always amazing. And um, also, you know, I made a conscious um, decision a few years ago to connect with like-minded people. So um, that really helped me, I think, as well. And I made, you know, great connections and friends and things like that. And um, also, I um, love, it's called AFL back home, it's Australian Football League. And a lot of people find that amusing, but I'm obsessed with my football team. And I make sure I follow all their games. And I'm missing that while I'm over here, but we're losing. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to open up the floor now. We have about 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, I was really moved by Chelsea's post that ended up on our um, the events site um, about just being yourself and be beautiful no matter what society is saying. And I think that um, I would like to hear more about how that in itself is activism, you know, changing people's mindsets and well, I think like the first thing is a lot of people have to get to there for themselves first. Um, you know, I think in society we're told to be certain a certain type of person in general. No matter who we are, we have pressures from society, regardless of you know if we care about animals or not. You know, and so the most important thing that people can do is find it, find ways in themselves to find their own beauty. Um, and once you can get to that point. Um, 
you can actually be a better activist um, because you know you are being true to who yourself is and then can spread it from there and people are gonna you know see how genuine you are more um, and you're not going to be distracted <laughs> with other things I mean I know personally when you know many years ago when I was you know trying to be a hardcore activist I had all these different pressures around me um, from both community members as well as activists of who, what I was supposed to be who I was supposed to look like in order to be a, a good activist um, and it, it really hurt me um, and I was not confident and I actually took I mean not a, truly a couple of years off because I was still vegan and doing um, you know diff zines back then where I'm also a zinester <laughs> um, and uh, and so I took a few years off to concentrate on um, you know working for uh, fat acceptance um, and trying to break stereotypes on that and I think that kind of saved me um, and so now I'm able to put it all together and I think it makes me um, a better person and a better activist and I think everyone can benefit from you know making sure that you know they find ways to accept themselves no matter what society is trying to tell you um, one of the issues I always have when I'm trying to do my own form of activism um, when I write my blog is that I find it really hard to negotiate the fine line between wanting to be approachable and sort of bring everyone in in a really accessible, open way, but also feeling like I'm diluting the message to the point where sometimes I don't even recognize it anymore, and I'm not sure anyone else does either. Like, you know, trying to modify language so sometimes I say plant-based instead of vegan, um, or I focus on the positive and show farm sanctuary videos instead of talking about all the horrors. But, you know, the downside for me is that I sometimes wonder if I'm actually not doing enough um, to really confront what can be really horrible things to talk about in an honest way. And I was wondering if you guys have any advice about how to keep your message strong and honest, but also be sure not to alienate people or look strident. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think if you're thinking about it, you're probably doing it. I mean, most people don't have the kind of self-awareness to even think, oh, maybe I'm alienating people. You just do your best. So it sounds like, I mean, I heard you speak about it yesterday, that that's what your goal is, and you might be being too hard on yourself, because, <laughs> I mean, you're thinking about it, you're probably rereading re your blog, I assume you're asking somebody to look at it before you post it, because that's, yeah, so I think you're doing okay, I mean, you can only do so much, I mean, it can't be, a, I think it's fine to say plant-based sometimes and vegan sometimes. I say I do that too. It's just what you're comfortable with at the moment, who you're talking to, yeah. what you feel like. We're just, you know, you're a blog. You're not, I mean, you're not a blog. You're just one person. <laughs> <laughs> you're not a whole organization with policies and so on. That's the beauty of blogging, really, is you don't have to be the same person today that you were yesterday. And you can try these different approaches. And I think that makes the most sense. And it sounds like you're being an honest person. So I don't think your question should be, how do I be a more honest person? Like you are an honest person. Yeah, no, that's great. I think sometimes you do forget that you're not speaking for everyone. You're just exactly. expressing yourself. Yeah, and most readers know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to actually also get into that a little bit in the opinionated bloggers panel later. So try and come to that. I, I have a dueling panel. Which <laughs> <laughs> Any, does anyone else want to speak? Yeah, to that? Um, Jenna, that's. Um, you know, um, I think it's just being genuine, like your audience, and um, like from a marketing perspective as well. If you know what your target audience wants, like say I was saying before, like my green earth group stuff, I say plant based diet. My people are vegan stuff, I say vegan. Mm -hmm. So just depending on who your who your target audience is, and even go through your blogs or your posts or whatever. See if you if you're trying to get more hits or whatever. Just see the most most popular things and maybe target it to that if you're worried about that sort of thing. I think also, I mean, especially from a blog perspective, like, you, obviously the extreme is that you can hit the undo button or delete the post or whatever if you end up feeling like, oh, maybe that was a little too edgy, but, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm more focused on creating, like, an overall idea of what I'm trying to get across, so more so, I mean, as Sid said, like, we're not perfect people, and, like, I mean, again, you know, 
because of the whole viral way that things can go, sometimes like one post is all people are really going to see from your blog, which is unfortunate because I mean, the idea is that it's your blog. It's not a post, it's your blog. And your blog has more of an overall voice. So I mean, like if you do put out one post, it's kind of just like one day you just had a really bad day and you're like, you know what? Just the hell with it. <laughs> <laughs> and that riles some feathers and everything. The thing is, like, you do have the comments, and you can go in in the comments and be like, you know what, guys, like, I'm sorry. Like, I had a bad day. I do feel this way, but I also kind of realized that, you know, there's like a softer side or something. So, I mean, you can do that, or maybe your next post could just be like, hey, here's like some sunshine and Disney esque stuff. Disney, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's the Canadian in me. Okay. Just friendly and yeah, yeah. happy. Um, it's about all that it's, healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm here now. If anything happens to me, I'm in trouble right now. Um, yeah, I mean, like, you, you know, you just maybe don't fret so much about one thing because you can kind of, I don't know. Well, it's a conversation. That's what it's, the blog is. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean. So it's not, like, it's not, you know, in print. I mean, it's in print, but it's not in stone. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. You can delete people's comments, too, you know. No, I love people's comments. <laughs> How many of you in this room have a blog that you think centers largely around food? So I have this talk that I just wanted to briefly mention this, that I've been giving at VegFest. It's called Let the Donut Do the Talking, Food as Activism. And I just wanted to quickly say a few, like four of the things that we touch on. Um, writing letters to the editor in response to articles about food, which there's people are obsessed with food, so they're all over the place these days. These are just like ways to sort of expand writing about food into activism. Um, bake once a week for your office. Do any of you work in an office? Yeah, so just, and but not only just baking, but adding the recipe and, and a why vegan brochure as well. Um, the hosting a vegan version of a, a holiday that traditionally centers around, you know, dead animals. I'm sure a lot of you do that already. And inviting non-vegans, because if we're just going to have a potluck for our friends, that's just fun. And if we invite non-vegans, then you could sort of call that more than fun, but also activism, maybe. Um, and then restaurant outreach is, is such an easy and important way of spreading compassion, including like while you're on vacation, not in New York or Portland or San Francisco or LA, but uh, seeing if you could get help get a vegan item on the menu. I just wanted to quickly say that and I also want to, I'm going to hand out our postcards while we're taking out the next question because they have a lot more ideas like that. So I'm going to hand those out and take the next question. Yes. Um, so oh, you and then the one behind you afterwards. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to hand these out too. So my blog is not about food, it's more about animal rights. And I'm fairly new, and I made a big mistake early on. I didn't realize that there's a difference between animal welfare and animal rights. And I quoted something by Gary, I think his last name is Francine, yes, <laughs> uh, Michael Vick. And <laughs> I got a ton of hits. Oddly, nobody was negative, but, it, but they used that as their blog. I mean, I got long responses. But the point is, I don't want to be divisive. I mean, I think everybody's, we all want the same thing. We just don't, I don't always agree with PETA. I don't agree with HSUS, but I think everybody wants the same thing. So how do you communicate that in your blog and still be clear on what your opinion is? I'm more of a Gary person than an HSUS person, but I don't want to alienate mm -hmm. anybody, and I definitely don't want to get non-vegans the idea that mm -hmm. vegans can't get along and there fight. You go. you know? Really good question. Well, let's vegans fight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Honestly, like, if you're not trying to be divisive, don't mention any of those people and just, you know. Mm -hmm. But you're who you are, you're going to say what you want to say, and that's your opinion, so what are you going to do? Like, if you don't say how you're feeling and what you think, then you're not helping anybody. So I'd say that's, again, it's a blog, it's a discussion, so say what you think, and, like, hopefully always be open to learning along the way. And I don't think we need to be some, you know, Whatever dancing with what were you saying before? No, oh, yeah. Disney yeah, the Disney stuff. Yeah, the Disney stuff. She had dancing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know it's just how it is. Like I've been at this, I've been doing this for twenty years. Like I'm the kid that you're talking about. Like I went vegan when I was sixteen, and you know now I'm twenty-two. <laughs> no, but it's just how it is. It's always been that way. There's never going to be this day that comes that. You know, Gary Francione and Wayne Pacelli are sitting around drinking tea. So, 
I think That's even just um, within your post, just putting questions in there, to even just to kind of illustrate the fact that you're not 100% certain on this topic. Like you're not the be all end all because if you are, are asking questions or saying, you know, does anyone have any other ideas or I'm not quite sure about such and such. Like even if, I mean, maybe in some ways to like some of the really hardcore people who are looking to just tear you down, that's a sign of weakness. But I'm catering to try and avoid those people. You probably should just shut the blog down because if they want to attack you, they're going to find something. But the people just a little from there over to the people are going to totally agree with you. If you just put it out there that, hey, you know, like, I'm not perfect. I'm not 100% sure about this. If someone wants to throw in an idea as to why maybe I should reconsider, go ahead. Um, I think that'll probably give a little more leeway in terms of, you know, if someone just totally goes, oh, my God, what did you say? Then you're like, hey, whoa, sorry, I messed up. You know, I see where you're going with it. And and also know that there are people that go around leaving comments and that's what they do with their entire lives. Seriously, some people on both ends, that's what they do. They look for blogs to leave comments. You can always um, filter your comments. You don't have to, like some of them are really cut and paste. I get cut and paste comments all the time that are usually the ones this long. You can Google a couple of words and see them elsewhere. You know, you know this person goes around to blogs to do that. And I think a good way I mean, like what you said, I didn't know there was a difference between animal rights and animal welfare. That's what people are looking for, and then to kind of spew their agenda on you. So I think a good thing is to not, if you're going to quote somebody, do a sentence and then put your own thoughts in there, you know? It doesn't have to be this whole thing about somebody else. I don't know. And, and yeah, sometimes filter your comments and know that it's not, it's people that have an agenda beyond your blog, you know? Is your blog geared toward animal rights activists, or is it geared toward people who don't know anything to try and get them more on board? Don't know anything, it's more about what's going on. Okay, then remember that, because the, what you're saying can slip into the world of infighting, which is the world of wasting time. <laughs> so uh, just remember your purpose, and, I, and I, this is all great advice, but, uh, but right behind you. Um. A little bit touching upon what Jenna said uh, in terms of language and words that you use. How do you guys deal with the stigma that still surrounds the word activist? Because I'm outside of Seattle, but I'm involved with Seattle animal rights. I've done stuff with Portland animal rights groups. In my town, I want to get more activist things going on. But we have a Tacoma animal rights book club and a, you know a vegan group that does animal rights stuff. People are all on the Facebook group and the Twitter, but they don't come out. And I feel like it's still because of the term activist. Like, how do you guys market events that maybe are with Bake activists? Sale. Yeah, we've <laughs> done that. We've done that. <laughs> We're trying to do a little well, bit. Well, we um, actually we talked about that a little bit from the Omaha stuff is that we have a meetup there, and that really helps. And if there's an activism thing going on, you talk about it at the meetup instead of making it. It's not trickery, it's, it's a meetup, honestly. But maybe you can also, you know, help me spray paint these teal cats this weekend. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, just community, I think, is, is community building. That's the heart of it, is, not, is you're gonna get people to come when they're part of the community. And it's kind of hard to community build doing specifically activist things sometimes. Sometimes it's easier at a conference or at a more casual meeting to get serious activism stuff done because you're building bonds with people, and that's when activism really works, I think. I and think that, yeah. yeah. We're still working on building the community. It's like yeah. I'm finally learning that people are coming out of the woodworks that came to the bake sale. They thought, oh, I never knew there were all these vegans. And, and so you're like, ah, you're there. Yeah, you can do this. So. Yeah, I think it's like getting your friends to do it. Another thing, when I, was, when I was younger, being more of a street kind of activist person, it was, you know, you'd call your friends to go to this demo. It wasn't calling strangers. Exactly. So um, I think that's the big part of it, is finding the people that want to do it, because they're out there and getting the trust there, because that's a big deal with activism too, is trusting each other. I think also, um, Dawn, like with, with what I do with, um, with my thing, is I try and focus on every single aspect and all the different types of people that might be interested in veganism. So like the environmental aspect, the more like potlucky type things, the bake sales, and it's just, showing you've got all these different things happening all the time like say every second every second month we have you know letter writing the other one we have pop laps you know the video viewings things like that try and think of all the different ways that you can get to people so it's like a marketing tool as well what 
what would bring people towards something and it's creating a community like I just said and um, like I have people that say oh I see I see your post I really want to come to something and I don't and I have a core team of say like 10 people that come or five people that come to everything and 10 that come to every second thing but there's you know hundreds that never do anything and you know, I don't, I don't know how you get those hundreds to get involved because we have meetups in um, Brisbane too, and there's you know a lot of people there that they never come. So it's it's trying to find what people like, and I, I get feedback as well with my greener stuff, and people say, oh, we want stuff that more like families can get involved with, or people that have kids, you know, they, are there child child minding things available, and you know we don't want to go to some some stranger's house, can we meet at a park, you know, just keep all these different things in mind and maybe ask for feedback maybe ask and like for our meetup I, I said to people why are people members here what do you want out of it if you ask that from people and actually listen to the feedback I think that's really good yeah Hi, um, <clears throat> this question is about uh, getting media um, for certain activities like big sales or um, like demos like demos and um, I know there is a lot of success with the make sales, but um, oftentimes I feel like media responds well to conflict or some kind of story that is really relevant and timely. And a lot of times these issues of animal suffering goes on all the time and it seems like there's not a lot of progress or change necessarily. Um, and so I wonder like, what kind of tips you have for getting media to cover your actions or events. The question was, uh, what, what kind of tips do they have for getting the media to cover your events? I, a very practical advice is a press release. Yeah. Um, and having a professional write the press release, uh, because there's certain language that's used. It's not just, um, you know, you can look on the internet and see how to do it, but mostly I would get somebody that really knows how to do PR to do the press release and just send it out to everybody. Maybe doing something, I don't know, are you thinking of something specific? Well, I'm thinking like, like a bake sale, I'm not sure like what the hook would be, even though I know it's awesome, like, I, I guess, I don't know like how much we would respond to That's a super great question. positive, you know, that. Well, well you're not the bake sale on CNN, how do you yeah. do that? Um, lettuce bikini. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That I CNN thing. That's like yeah. That was just well. There's lots of vegans in the media, so the guy that wrote that CNN report was vegan. Right, but he came he came onto it because you wrote a CNN. I right. Report. Okay, I see what you're saying. Got it. So it's okay, yeah. CNN good good advice. Do what I did. <laughs> yeah, CNN has these I reports. Have you seen those? Yeah, so just do those. I guess, yeah, that's a good idea, Jasmine. I did that. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess from the Thank you for being my brain. <laughs> I know, Danielle, from my um, my perspective, what I was doing um, media for um, a, um, a friend that did a 500 kilometer walk from um, in Australia, and that's about 310 um, miles over here. And um, we, we just focused on the free food giveaway. So that was something that we actually advertised a bit in the media. Um, so we didn't necessarily say vegan food giveaways or th anything like that, but we just said free food giveaway and it also coincided with, I don't know if a lot of you have heard about um, the Indonesian live trade that we had in Australia, that um, all these abattoirs were you know, not looking after animals properly and um, it got banned for a while and it just so happened that that happened at the same time. So we just linked that in with the press releases as well. So keep up to date with what's happening in the community, things that you could link in with. Can I, I'll, yeah, another, I, I just remembered that I do this. So <laughs> um, one thing that's important is keeping ties with the media, making those connections in the first place because a lot of times I will write to an editor at a newspaper and tell them something's going on. They don't always listen, but they often do and sometimes even sending those initial press releases, getting a little back and forth with, find out who the specific um, editor is at the newspaper that covers it, know the, 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 um, the media outlet that you're looking to go to, to have cover it and kind of target it towards them, and to make the relationships you know, there so that you have somebody to contact in the future. So getting in touch with the food editor for a food event, getting in touch with the entertainment editor, for political stuff, it's a little bit harder, honestly, if it's just a protest or something like that. But sometimes, if, if it's controversial enough, what's that? Get a celebrity to come to the 
protest, and they'll cover that. Yeah, that's true. If you can get a celebrity. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, just just forming the relationship somehow, it is pretty crucial to getting future coverage. I just have one thing to add. Uh, the <coughs> biggest news story that we had for our announce was this huge spread in Time Out New York, and it was because we exploited the fact that me and my partner Marianne, who we run our hen house together, we exploited the fact that we're gay. And so Time Out New York was like, gay, sexy, you know? <laughs> and so it was this huge spread, but it was all about animal rights. It just was in the gay and lesbian section. So um, that sounds exploitative and whatever, I mean, it is. But exploit <laughs> something of coming yourself, if you know what I mean. Like find a, an inroad. And also um, on our hen house, we had the PR person for Farm Sanctuary write a, a very lengthy guide to getting media to show up. So if you go to ourhenhouse.org, you could, and you search for, well, you could just type in anything, like uh, media tips. But if you type in Meredith Turner, she's the woman who, who wrote it, and it's really useful. So I just have a question for Can the I panel. Add something to sure. Add something? And also from like a music perspective, and um, like also from Peter too, what Sunny was talking about, the street team that gets involved, you can actually get people to put out posters, hand out flyers, things like that, and get people to maybe target specific um, media people, or try, you know, get each person to find five different media contacts um, that week or something like that. Just you know, think outside the square with it. My question is, do you want to take the rest of the time for each of you to do a 30 second closing or do you want to take another question? Another question. Okay. Another question. In the very back. Thank you. Um, Ryan, I'm really glad that you brought up the intersectionality of veganism with other social movements. Um, I'm a vegan feminist and I write the vegan feminist blog and try to fuse the two identities. So I was wondering if you and everyone else could um, speak about how you fuse your other identities to not like rather than bifurcating them, but combining them all. Um. Again, the uh, the creative director would probably be the best one to say. She's she's actually doing women's studies for her master's, so I'm I'm definitely more the student than the teacher on that end. Um. I mean, for me, I've definitely I've posted some things, and I've also left some things in draft form and WordPress that I just haven't had the courage to post. Um, that just dealt more with the issue of considering people as actual people and how that relates to if we're going to be concerned about animals, like are people not animals as well? Um, and I know that's, that's probably ruffled a few feathers and maybe I've lost a few followers, but I mean the magazines pay what you can, so feel free to not download it for free, it's okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I just, in the same way that we've been talking about it, like, it's it's your voice, like, just go with it. And I mean, if you, if you feel that, and there should be a push to say, hey, you know, yes, I'm vegan, but I'm also a feminist. I'm also, I'm a, a minority in some other way, and that needs to be talked about, and that needs to be represented, then do it. Because, I mean, in the same way that we're talking about creating activism for veganism, if you don't do it, someone else is probably waiting in the wings to be like, you know what, I, I don't quite have the courage to do it, but if someone else was there, maybe I would. And, you know, you could be that person that does it. And, I mean, kudos to you for having, like, a vegan slash feminist blog. And, I mean, yeah, like, that's, you know, the next issue is kind of the first step towards that. We're definitely hoping to get a lot more voices that fit that sort of category so that we can bring out more. But I mean, there are people out there that are doing it. Hopefully we'll highlight some of those folks. And that's probably the best way that I try and do it is just by saying like, there are these other people out there who have like way bigger backgrounds in it than I do. And they're awesome and you should pay attention to them. And I mean, not that Tofu is like a massive media CNN sort of deal, but I mean, we at least can give some attention to those people. So I guess that's the way I'm trying to do it. We're actually just about out of time, but I wanted Sorry. to no. That was a really I, that was a really good question. That was a really good answer. And for those, I know there were a lot more questions. Feel free to come up to them afterwards or outside. And I just encourage you to, you know, remember that there's 267 chickens who die every second in the United States alone, and keep that in mind and incorporate it in ways that you can into your platforms. Thank you so much for our panelists.